Thank you for joining us tonight, everyone. Um, welcome to the WGGB event, um, Making Choices Matter, a conversation with John Ingalls. Um, so this event has been held in conjunction with the IGDA, um, and it's taken place at our annual LSBU event, um, which is usually held around Christmas, but uh, COVID happened, so here we are a few months late. Um, so this uh, event site is followed to our Miller Festival, which we held um, last summer, which is all available online. Um, and we're already planning our events for the year ahead, um, which is going to include another mini festival that we've just uh, decided is going to be held in the last week of April. Um, so make sure you keep in touch and follow us for further announcements and further events coming up over the year. Um, so as Andy said earlier, I'm Samantha Webb, um, along with Andy, I co-chair the video game subcommittee of the WGGB. Uh, which is the Writers Guild of Great Britain. <laughs> um, so the Writers Guild is a TUC affiliated um, union that represents writers in TV, film, theatre, comedy books, animation, radio, and of course, video games writers. Um, one of the things we do for, for writers in the UK is um, providing them with guidelines that give advice to anyone working um, in games narrative um, around working conditions and things like that. And we're currently in the process of updating them um, with new ones we released later this year. So keep an eye out for them. Um, we also have obviously membership for full members of the Guild, which covers things like uh, contract vetting, advice, um, and also these kind of events. Um, and there are different membership tiers as well for candidate and student um, members. So if you are considering joining up, um, head over to the WGGB website and you can find out more details. Um, without further ado, then let's get started. Um, so John, uh, thank you for joining us this evening. It's really exciting to have you here. Um, could you introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. Uh, I'm John Ingold. I'm the narrative director of Inkle, which is a tiny little independent game studio that makes uh, narrative based games. We've been going about 10 years. We were founded with my friend Joe Humphrey. We met at Sony PlayStation and had this sense that we weren't going to get to do what we wanted to do there. So we started a company and made mobile games, which was a good lark while it lasted. Um, We've made a bunch of things that I hope people have heard of. We made a game called 80 Days that people liked because it had lots of writing in it. And we made a game called Heaven's Vault, which people liked because it had a hieroglyphic language in it. And we made a game called Pendragon, which I liked because it had King Arthur in it. Um, and in, those, in that time, I have been doing design and narrative design and story design uh, and writing as well, where the first games we made were all adaptations of existing stuff increasingly we're doing our own stuff more so it's been quite a learning journey for me really I started very much as a designer who did some writing and these days I feel like maybe I am actually a writer now <laughs> maybe I get to call myself one of those which has been quite nice for me um yeah that's us perfect I think you're allowed to call yourself a writer like I'm gonna go ahead and give you permission to do that <laughs> thank you <laughs> um <laughs> so yeah it's really great to have you here thank you um so uh, the first question I have for you then, um, so Inkle, uh, you know, is obviously renowned, as you said, for, for making games with really interesting characters um, and interesting narrative choices. Um, so the first question I've got for you is, how do you approach creating choices that feel appropriate for the character um, or the story you're telling, as well as being satisfying for different types of players? Mm. So that, I mean, that is an enormous question, really. And it's hard to know where to start with answering it whether because you're you're always having to think from two different directions at the same time right you have to think about it as a writer and you have to think about it as a designer and that question pretty much says how do you do both mm -hmm. of those things at the same time and the answer is well, I suppose you don't really but um what we try to do is we try to have a core idea which is that the character in the game shouldn't be doing anything that the player isn't doing and the player shouldn't be doing anything that the character isn't doing um, so they, whatever, or to put that in a positive way, whatever the player is doing is what the character is doing and vice versa. So some really simple examples of that. We have a rule that the protagonist is not allowed to speak unless the player has pushed a button that says speak now. Mm. Um, and that might be a button that demands them to say something, or it might be a button which is a specific particular line of dialogue but we never ever let the protagonist just talk of their own free will which is fairly unusual in games I think like we never have a traditional cutscene where a protagonist will walk in and do something mm. and um, that idea I think is what grounds everything because if you're doing that then you never offer a choice which the game can't support because it has to be part of the gameplay you never offer a choice which the character wouldn't do because 
you can't write it anyway if you want to it, it sticks out as being kind of nonsensical um and it gives you quite a good constraint to to come up with the ideas um of what of what you will do so you know in something like 80 days we quite often have choices where the main character Pascal 2 is able to say i don't want to interact with this particular chunk mm. of content at all i just want to move straight on so as a writer your job is well how do i put that in a way that isn't the same in every single city all that's characterful all that's funny um and that's an interesting challenge and that's a good a good use of writing to support the game but it, they're never we, we try to avoid the position where the two things are in conflict with each other by just disallowing that from the start um i think that kind of answers the question <laughs> but i'm yeah. not really sure it's it's still well you work very hard and hope that you manage to achieve it i think it's the real yes answer. yeah i think that's very fair thank you um so on that as well like have you ever um like how do you i'm just trying to find the the exact wording of the question that i've got in mind here so um it's the idea around um when you have dialogue options for characters and um you know, when you have choices for, for the player to pick that the character is then kind of going to say, you know, how do you um, how do you find being able to get that subtext across? Um, uh, the example, this, this is a question from um, from someone that sent in. And the idea is that, you know, when you're playing an RPG and you see one of the options, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, NPC, I'd like to be your friend. And you, you click that button thinking you're going to be nice to them. And then, you know, out comes some like snarky comment or you, you upset them. Um, and sometimes it can feel a bit wrong footed as a player because you, you, mm. you know, you didn't pick up on that subtext. Um, mm. Is that something that you, that you have experience with or? Um, so, like yeah, I mean, if anyone who's played Heaven's Vault will know that we we definitely have choices where you think you're going to say something nice and then out comes an incredibly snarky response. <laughs> Aaliyah, the, the main character in that game, is she's very strong-willed and one of her things is that she hates robots and she has this robot psychic mm -hmm. and she constantly sort of uh, nags and attacks and berates this robot for its very existence and there's very little you can do about that as a player. You can try to hold her back but I love that thing mm. of of, of pressing a button and having her come out with something awful and go oh no um because i think having a distance between the player and the protagonist for me is way more interesting than having the two things be in the same place and i get that that's mm -hmm. a game style thing and you know if you're doing a tabletop role-playing game that probably doesn't make as much sense or, or something like that um but for me i think that the idea of um choices and interactivity is never to put the player in control I, i've talked about this sort of mm -hmm. quite often previously i'm really not interested in the idea of control i think control is a is a bad and unhealthy idea when you're interacting with art or storytelling or other human beings the idea that you can control anything is a bit weird mm. um, i'm much more interested in in influence and in tension and in risk and all those middle ground things which are really interesting so i like it when we'll write a line of dialogue which gives you the sense that it might be friendly or it gives you the sense that it might be aggressive and then you choose it hoping that it'll go the way you do you, you want it to and then you see where it comes out and you can definitely get that wrong you can telegraph it completely wrong and have the player go wait no what do you what do you i don't i didn't mean that at all and that's frustrating and so you do better and you try and write it better um but the very the very best lines don't allow the player, in my opinion, to make a choice to choose something to happen and then have that thing happen. Because mm. then why is that interesting to do? I might as well be the game designer. I might as well just control the numbers under the hood. There's no point dressing up in dialogue. And you see this a lot in RPGs. And I find RPGs quite hard to play sometimes because of it. But a choice will say, you know, here's a line of dialogue. And it'll say, bracket, nice. And you go, <laughs> well, OK, I'll just find one nice point. Move on. Um, what I want from the conversations that I write and the conversations in games that I like playing is I want risk attached to what I say mm. because that's what makes conversation with human beings exciting and interesting like you know that thing where you go to a networking event which was this thing we did 25 years ago where we all stood in a room and gave each other germs I vaguely remember <laughs> yeah I don't I was never very good at them because they're quite stressful right because you stand next to someone you don't know anything about and you attempt conversation mm. lines which may go horrifically wrong and that's definitely not the purpose of networking meetings but it is kind of why they make you pay attention mm. and that's why when it goes well it feels like a good thing i'm just talking about friendship aren't i like the way that you make friends is never a straightforward 
thing and that give and take between what you do and what someone mm. else does is the whole joy of it it's the whole meat of it i don't care about moving the number in the background at the end that's that's a kind of secondary thing i care about that mm. moment when you don't know how something is going to land and then ideally when you're playing your game you say your thing and then there's a little moment and then the character you're talking to either accepts and supports you and you feel oh you feel loved mm. or they go off on one and get really angry and you feel oh no and I think Heaven's Vault tries to put that between the player and the protagonist as well which I like though I know some people didn't um, but that idea of the gap between people mm. is, that's that's what we're here for that's what we should be thinking about so um, I object to the premise of the question that one should be <laughs> telegraphing what a choice should do. You should give people a suggestion and you should play with them and you should tease them and you should undermine them and occasionally empower them. And in that interplay between the player and the author, that's the whole thing. Mm. And if we just ignore that, then I don't know, what's the point? It's basically the idea of writing, um, like you were saying, realistic conversations in games. So rather than that very robotic, yeah, nice option, I'll do the nice option, I'll do the sarcastic option. It's more that um, organic give and, give and take between, you know, where is this going to go and what's going to happen and how are they going to respond? Um, yeah, exactly. Because like the most exciting conversations that I have in real life at the moment are with my four-year-old trying to convince him to put his shoes on. And there's <laughs> this constant interplay of, will this be the line that gets him to do it? Or no, or, what's he talking about now? And why are we doing this? And that, you know, um, they're high drama, those conversations. Mm. They have high risk and high reward. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's that it's not quite a realistic conversation that you want to go for because realistic conversations are also often very turgid and they're about the washing up and whatever. But that, yeah, that sense that, that can you make the character in the game feel like they actually have a heart and soul of their mm. own, which is operating in real time while you're playing? Because I think as soon as a choice has, you know, a little heart on the end of it to tell mm -hmm. you that this is the sexy option, then you've removed that character's <laughs> ability to have any humanity before they've even had a chance to speak, which is kind mm -hmm. of bad. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think looking at it the other way as well, it's, you know, if you have that kind of that, that blank slate character that all of RPGs do, um, you're never going to win anyway because people have their own ideas about what, what is a nice comment or, um, you know, what the natural thing to do next is. So I think there's definitely something to be said for having um, a character like Aaliyah that you said, you know, that, that she has her own personality and she has her own um, her own way of speaking and, and dealing and observing the world around her. Yeah, um, I mean, I think in most, in most of those blank slate RPGs that I've played, the reality is there is a character there. They're just mm. pretending that there isn't. And you know, when you play one where you kind of just happen to guess what that character is and you fit into it, then it's okay. And they are moldable and they are shapeable mm -hmm. and that's fine. There are good writers doing good work to make that happen. Mm -hmm. But it's always going to be a limited system. Um, and it feels to me like a slightly, I don't know, just like a slightly odd goal to go for, for like a blank slate you can tune mm -hmm. as opposed to just, just be a person. You know, if I'm, make, if I'm playing a Poirot game, let me be Poirot. <laughs> I want to be precious and annoying, not some sort of semi yep. half Poirot who's actually quite nice to people. Like, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I'm interested in what your uh, thoughts are going to be on this next question then, which is around um, presenting consequences to the player. Um, so how, how do you... I suppose, how do you feel about this and how do you do it um, around presenting consequences to the player without them feeling like they're being punished or like they're having options taken away from them? I think I can guess probably what you're going to say based on uh, the last <laughs> one, but, you know, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so, um, I mean, in general, the, the business of, of communicating consequence to the player is really important. I mean, when, when we started working, Telltale were just hitting the big mm. time and they had their Clementine will remember remember this thing that absolutely everybody remembers because it was stupidly simple and stupidly effective and it really worked and it said oh right I, I did something important and uh you know we've always tried to avoid that kind of very obvious feedback but it's always a struggle because people are very inclined to start a game with the assumption that nothing they do will change anything because it's easier to pay attention it's easier to control if nothing is happening if you're just clicking the button it's much easier so you have to convince people that consequence is happening and you have to convince them really fast and you have to keep convincing them because they'll constantly try to reverse engineer it and say, oh, I see mm. that conversation would have gone anyway. You know, it, it, what I do doesn't really matter. because That's nice and safe, isn't it? That makes you feel safe. Um, 
But in order to do that, in order to show that consequence is happening, you only really have two ways of doing it. And one of them is a surprising reward in which a character three turns later will say, but wait a minute, you mm. just said that earlier and, and you go, oh, yeah, I did, didn't I? But that's risky because quite often players don't really remember what they said mm. three turns ago. So the reward part doesn't necessarily feel very rewarding until you already have the player's trust. The flip side is punishment. Punishment PAs really, really understand because players really want to play your game well and get it right. People hate getting things wrong. Mm. So... If you have a character turn around and say, right, I'm not talking to you anymore because of what you just said about my mother. And then they walk away. Players go, "Uh oh, <laughs> and they can see that they didn't have to say it, but they did say it. And so almost all of the games that I write will have a scene very early on in which you can really screw up a conversation. And the reality is that I've written 20 or 30 different ways you can screw up this conversation and it's not going to go well because this character mm -hmm. is not a nice character or, or whatever the circumstance is. But like, that idea of taking things away from the player. Yeah, you have to do it carefully so the player doesn't get too, you know, hurt, basically. Mm. But, like, again, it goes back to that idea of control. Like, if a player can just walk into a room and do whatever they want, then what's the point of playing this game? Like, you might as well play with Lego because Lego does what you tell it to. Like, it's got to push back, and it's got to push back in funny and interesting and surprising ways. So... Yeah, I think a little bit of punishment is important. I think it's mm. good. There's that quote that Meg, uh, Meg Giant um, said in her talk about 80 days, which was really came out of the writing process that, that she went through on that game and that we went through on that mm. game, which was whoever heard of that story where a protagonist gets exactly what they want, um, which is super applicable to games. And, but I quite like to take that down to, like, to the really micro level of just simply, you know, you ask when was the last time you played Assassin's Creed and your character said, tell me about um, so-and-so of such and such a place? And the other person said, no, no I'm not <laughs> going to tell you about them. I don't trust you. Like, that's a moment that just doesn't happen because that's not the mode of the game, but I miss it. I feel like mm. I want these people to push back at me on even simple questions like that. I don't know that the majority of the games audience wants that, but that's because I think they play too many games which are not, like, narratively challenging and i think that's a sad thing hmm. so i yeah i don't have an editor so i get to do this kind of thing <laughs> i think yeah definitely as gamers we kind of um we learn by doing don't we so the more games that we play that follow that that idea of obviously i can go and talk to an npc and get the information i need or um you know as long as my charisma level is high enough then i know i'm going to be able to talk to anyone i need to um and you're right i think we do i, I think it probably is also a sign of why um and you know as a games writer myself I probably shouldn't admit this but I often play games and just x through the narrative really quickly because I'm like yeah I get it you know I know what's going on let's just kind of go through um and it is nice to then find a game where what you're saying does matter and, and how you're interacting with the other characters does matter um but you're right I think that you know there, there are games where you can get that and then there are other games that we just the expectation is there that that won't happen and we can we can have the easy ride effectively and we can yeah and like, nice it's options. super important it's super important that a game communicates up front what kind of game mm. it's going to be. Like, you can't, you can't give someone the Spider-Man game and then suddenly make it that if they say things in the wrong way, then everybody doesn't like you anymore. You've got to be Spider-Man because that's what the point of the game is. Well, fair enough. Okay. Um, but I think the space of possible interactive experiences is much, much larger and much more interesting mm. than that particular sliver of design um, will ever explore mm. and so well you know as an indie studio why, why do this when you've got this whole field mm. to play in let's go over there and have some fun absolutely um so we've talked obviously a bit about the kind of stuff that uh that we should be thinking about when it comes to choice but one of the questions we've had is um what aren't we thinking about that we should be thinking about when it comes to choice in games um so what often gets left out of the picture well, yeah, okay. The question is, who are you talking about, though? Because everybody's thinking about their, <laughs> like, you know, which games? I don't know. Um, like, I can only really speak for myself. What am I? Sure. What do I worry about? And, um, like, I think the thing that I always come back to is character and humanity, really. That's the thing that I'm most interested in. Like, all the time, I want games that let me express my humanity and discover the humanity of the people that I'm interacting mm. with. And because I care about that, because that's what I think we probably care about when we're interacting with fiction in general. Yeah. Like, um, if you're watching Star Trek, you want to 
interact with Commander Data because he's an awesome character. You want to interact with Picard because he's an awesome character. And the plot is just a method for doing that. And a lot of games, I feel, don't really leverage that, that idea that the character and being with the character is one of the core drivers. Um, even games which I think really work really hard at this. So, you know, RPGs with their party-based mechanics, they're sold on their characters, players love them on their characters, and yet there's very little just sit down and chill with these characters. There's a bit of that, but it's always got some kind of goal attached to it and some kind mm -hmm. of endpoint and some kind of quest line and some kind of sense that you, you're you doing this for a reason which isn't actually the person that you're talking to. So I think there's I think there's room even in games which really care about that to make that better. And then in the wider space of games, like there are plenty of games that, that don't care about doing that at all. Mm. You know, I'm, I've always been interested in how do you take Uncharted, which is a character based game with some gunplay and jumping. Um, but really, it's about the characters and make it feel like something where I can actually get to interact with the characters. Is that possible or does it fundamentally break Uncharted? I will never have the budget to discover this, but I'm interested in that as a question. Um, yeah, so I, th I think that that's my core thing. I'm just basically fascinated about dialogue, really, and just putting people in dialogue with people mm. and then letting things spin out of that. Um, everything else is fine. Everything else is working fine. <laughs> that seems to me <laughs> to be the thing that, that could use the most work. I'm, I'm quite curious about your, uh, like, obviously, when you start making a game like um, Heaven's Fall, Tracy Day, it's like, is, like, how does that kick off from a narrative point of view? Like, do you ever, you know, is, is it ever just like a, a seed of an idea around, um, around a, a, a dialogue you'd like to explore or a particular kind of character you'd like to create? Like, or, or is it always very different? Like, how, I suppose, like, talk, you know, talk us through um, how you get started yeah. and how, how do you design a compelling narrative? Like, what's that first little part that kicks you off yeah so i mean heaven's vault was a really epic project in that it i mean it was a four-year a four-year production development with more mm. stuff before it which is longer than anything else i've done and it had a huge amount of, of world building and narrative building and all that stuff which i hadn't really ever ever really thought about in detail before so there was a lot of learning that went on a lot of wasted time as well but i think I think there are there are kind of different levels to it. So if, if you're building something with quite a complicated plot and Heaven's Vault has quite a complicated plot, then you need to be thinking about that almost in a linear narrative way, really. You, you may eventually end up producing alternative routes and plots and different, but, but, but you've got to have some story themes you want to hit or something you want mm. to talk about. Or like, I think for Heaven's Vault, a lot of it came out of thinking about the technology that this world was allowed to have and then what that might mean and what might be interesting ways to use that technology and hide that technology and that kind of thing, which really got nothing to do with writing at all, but it got me to some interesting places. Um, so that's just thinking like a writer, I suppose. Like, I've got this, what can I do with it? Um, thinking like an interactive writer, I guess I tend to work in scenes so, uh, you know, at the start of Heaven's Vault, there's, an, there's a scene between Aaliyah and her, her university professor, who's sort of her mother, but sort of not her mother. And they have this relationship where they're kind of, they kind of hate each other and they kind of love each other. And for me as a scene, that was just a really like, yes, yeah, okay, they set up the plot about some missing person. But really, it's about these two women who just can't find a way to get along, even though they both kind of want to. And that, as an opening scene, struck me as an interesting way to get into the shoes of a character who was definitely not going to be you, because she has things mm. she cares about and things she can't get past that you, the player, can't get her past by pressing a button. And that, that felt like a really good, strong, dramatic opening and it could have been a play and it could have been a novel and then actually in terms of writing that scene you just start writing an argument and having the players argue with each other except that I write interactively which means that every time a character says something I think about a space of things that the player mm. might say and then I try to write to that space and you know I have a process which is fairly well developed now of, of making something which is sort of linear but a bit branchy and then tangling it up until eventually you end up with this thing which is impossible to debug but sort of works <laughs> um and you know i rely a lot on on the structure of ink which is our, our scripting mm -hmm. language which is built basically as a sort of drop through so that if people start here you know they're going to get to the end or they're going to get to one of three endings you know that and the conversation might not quite make sense if you choose a particular route but that's a price i'm willing to pay mm. for the complexity that you get if you if you kind of build it this way so then generally a scene like that 
will always have a, a, a beginning because there's something that incites the scene. It'll always usually have one end. Like in that mm. scene, you know, Professor Mayari wants to tell you this guy's missing. She's going to tell you that. There is no way you can get her to not tell you that. That's all that matters from a plot point of view. But you come out of the scene and maybe you had an okay conversation. Maybe you had a massive bust up and that can be remembered and used later on. So from a plot design point of view, it's one, one entry, one exit. Mm -hmm. is actually very straightforward very simple again it could be a play and from the player's point of view it's this hopefully this dynamic evolving situation in which they come out of it and go oh man i just had an argument i really didn't want to have oh yeah and i know where to go next as well mm. how convenient and that feels to me to be the right way up so i guess what i'm what i'm always trying to do is to get scenes with good clear purposes to them Mm -hmm. you know a good inciting incident the player knows why they're there something interesting happens which tells them what to do next or where to go next or what to care about next but along the way there is enough emotional interplay that they don't notice what we're doing when mm. we structure the scene it doesn't feel like a bullet point it doesn't feel like they're being moved through this sausage machine um which sounds really linear and to be honest it is basically pretty linear but that's not a problem because mm. you only branch when you need to um you know, it doesn't preclude you from having a scene in which you take a catastrophic decision at some point, which has a huge impact. But that's not your that's not your default setup. I think one thing that people, when they're starting to think about branching narrative, is they think that well, they think about branching narrative, and actually, you don't need to branch to be engaging or interactive mm -hmm. at all because the player hasn't got a flowchart, and you shouldn't give them a flowchart player just has the moment of decision and the moment of reaction and the sense of what happened next and mm. and you know i when we release our games we tend to find that there are some people who really love them and really get them and really engage with them and then some people who tell us that we're doing it just wrong 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 <laughs> wrong for the whole way through that everything about what we're doing is wrong and we should just go back to school or give up <laughs> um and I can't tell you which of those groups of people is right. I can't play my games myself and decide what I think about them because I'm so sure. close to them and I, I can see the wires. But, um, but I think it's an interesting thing to be doing. And I think it works. And it is sort of a magic trick, but then all fiction is <laughs> a magic trick, actually. None of these yep. characters are real. Picard is not a person. Um, <laughs> it's all there to make you feel like you've been moved through an experience. And that's the game. That's what we're, that's mm -hmm. why, I don't know, that's what's fun, isn't it? I can't remember what the question was now. Yeah, I, I don't ask me. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was interesting, though. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, but I feel like we could probably have talked about that all night, to be fair. Um, <laughs> so, when it comes to because obviously we were we started off talking about um how you get started with the game so you know is it is it that that kind of narrative seed of an idea etc cetera, etc cetera. um so something i know that a lot of people like i know we've got a lot of designers on the call um a lot of people who are interested in the the practical making of games so um when you're making a um a re-narrative driven game like you do uh at what point do you bring in game design like is it something that um you know do you always have like game mechanics at the back of your mind even from the start or do you tend to find that you'll start to build the story, the world, the characters, and, and then start to look at how mechanics fit in? Um, obviously, again, this is a very personal question of, of how do you particularly do it? How does how do you do it in Inkle? Um, but I think it's something yeah, that a lot well, of people are interested in. I mean, one thing that I always feel <laughs> I have to caveat this kind of thing with is I have a ridiculous amount of creative freedom considering, you know, the majority of people who work in this industry are given mm -hmm. a game design and they have to work within its constraints and often those constraints are pathological to narrative mm -hmm. and, you know, they, they do incredible jobs of creating narrative where by rights no narrative should possibly be able to <laughs> exist. It's, 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 it's really terrific actually. Um, for us, because we have that freedom, we, we kind of run with it. So game design tries to be there the whole time i mean if we come up with a narrative without having any game mechanics attached then we can't build anything so it's kind of academic mm. like you know that thing where you meet uh, like an eight-year-old and they say oh you make games i've got an idea for a game there's an alien octopus and it lives on a planet and it has and you go that's nice <laughs> but, <laughs> but in no way is that a game that's a dream it's different um so we try not to do that though of course you know you get enthusiastic sometimes don't you um so our starting point is usually, I think I mentioned it earlier, but basically this idea of an activity. So what's an activity that the player can be doing, which mm. is both narrative and characterful and is possible to make game mechanical at the same time. So 
you know, heaven's vault started with this idea of space archaeology. It's archaeology in space um, because that's an activity. I can start to imagine things that our archaeologist mm-hmm. character could do that could be made into a game, but I can see how it's narratively impactful as well. 80 days, you're a traveler, same thing, really. Like you can kind of see the thread of that straight away. Mm-hmm. Um, and in any a sort of project or prototype that we've made where we have a sense of narrative but we don't have that activity underlying it we we stall and you know if we make a game which is very very gamey without that narrative layer then it can be very hard to get that narrative layer back in in a way that's convincing um so our most recent game pendragon is like a tactic strategy game and we tried to build a very gamey game and put the narrative on top of it and while there's a lot i like about that game some people played it and said well I just find the narrative isn't that compelling or well integrated or isn't English enough somehow and I know what they mean because it doesn't start from the same place as as the other games we've made Um, so I think yeah I think our our rule of having everything that the player does be something that the protagonist does and vice versa Mm. is is kind of key to that so I remember when we were building heaven's vault i was playing a lot of the witcher at the time and the witcher is a game about this guy with a sword who goes around killing monsters <laughs> and picking an awful lot of flowers and like the witcher the witcher definitely does collect flowers that is a thing he does but the amount of flowers that i my gerald mm-hmm. collected compared to the one that the geralds in the tv series collect is it is astronomical and that that sort of thing is a it, you know that that's a red flag to me and it's ridiculous because it's obviously just a minor collection mechanic that makes you explore the environment i get that but like the amount of time my Gerald spent wandering into empty houses and stealing everybody's food was not an appropriate amount narratively and I see that as a problem um, and that's a point where the game design was winning over the narrative mm. and everyone's okay with it no one blinks an eye we all understand why and why this is happening but I would rather that it didn't happen because it's clutter it's narratively clutter but to be honest it's kind of game design clutter as well actually in that particular instance but like so the question is, can we make sure that really every button that the player is pressing is a meaningful narrative button, or at least a sensible narrative button? Because mm. um, then that whole ludo narrative dissonance thing just doesn't even turn up. Like it's it's built in from the start. So that that's what we aim to do. Obviously, in every given project or genre, you know, it can be extremely challenging. Like we spent about a year working out what on earth an archaeologist could do that would be actually interesting for a player to do because most archaeology is really careful and slow um like we got somewhere in the end there are other takes possible i'm sure um but yeah i think you can't a very good friend of mine once said you can't write in a vacuum and she didn't mean game design versus writing she meant not just writing the first thing that came to your head and declaring it to be worth reading and she's right great advice especially for new writers but I think it really applies to us in games as well. You can't write an octopus squid alien story in a vacuum divorced from the game design. You have to be thinking mm-hmm. within the context of the game because the game is your stage and you're putting your play on that stage. You can't yeah. write a play in which an army comes over the mountain. You'd, nobody would even think of doing that. And the problem that we have as game designers is purely that the rules of every game are different and they're always changing and what technology can do and what interactions can do and what players can handle is changing mm. all the time. So we constantly have to relearn an entirely new language of theatre for every bloody game we make and half the time we have to invent it ourselves. Um, so the fact that anyone ever manages to tell a good story in a game at all is kind of majestic, really. Um, so well done, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Round of applause. Yes, um, exactly. <laughs> that's brilliant thank you um so i've got a another question that you were sent in earlier um oh, in fact by the way a, a people who are listening live um we will be taking q a towards the end so um as we're going along if there are any questions that you're itching to ask john um make sure you pop them into the chat and we'll we'll have about 15 minutes at the end to go through some of them um but john one of the ones i've got um which I'm, I'm really interested in from a, you know, from your, your kind of position as a, a founder of a, um, a narrative game studio, um, is this idea of uh, play style. So, you know, we, we're used to players having play styles when it comes to pure mechanics, but do you find that there are also branching narrative play styles? Like, do you, you know, do you ever sit down and think, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I've kind of got these three main narrative players in mind I'm thinking of um, as I'm, you know, as I'm building the narrative or um, kind of, do you find that working, working you tend to play in the same way? Yeah. Yeah, actually, <laughs> um, I, I tend to not 
work that kind of um, formulaically, mm. which sounds terribly pretentious, but it's just because I don't have a very good memory for things like for facts. So I tend to feel my way every time. But I think the reality is, yeah, there definitely are different play styles. There are some really obvious ones, like there is always someone who wants to just play nice the whole time yeah. and to be kind and nice and polite and gentle. And you have to provide gentle, low conflict options in almost all except the most extreme circumstances. You don't have to support them and you can push back against that player and you can make that player have a miserable time, but you kind of have to acknowledge their existence because otherwise mm. it feels like there's a gap in the choices that you're offering. And that happens a lot during drafting. You'll play it, your player scene and you'll go, wait a minute, I'm just being a total git on every single <laughs> choice. So I better, I better sort of mellow this out a bit. And then you have the opposite player who's the kind of destructive, sarcastic, chaotic mm -hmm. player who really wants to just like insult everybody and dominate everything and break everything um and then you have the the kind of um the 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 ducking the the del boy character the wheeler dealer who's always ducking and diving and dodging and trying to like wheel out things and do cunning things um and i guess those are the three that i work with i in a talk i did a few years ago i talked about this basic pattern that i fall back on when i don't know what to do which i call accept reject deflect Mm -hmm. um so if you need to offer some choices and an npc offers something then either you just accept the premise or you reject the premise or you deflect it on something else and that's basically low conflict high conflict and like maniac and those are my three working categories <laughs> and i tend to try and just fall back to that because it mostly works to be honest and kind of covers the space that i want but i think at the same time it's really important when you're working not on a moment by moment but kind of across the course of a scene to not let people be those characters like exclusively because if someone is just a low conflict player the whole way through and that works out for them mm. i just find that that's too docile an experience like low conflict people should be forced into situations where they have to show a bit of grit and you know what they show their grit about shows you who they are and what matters to them and that's a significant and celebratory moment and high conflict people need to be shown that they really need to calm the hell down sometimes <laughs> and just be a bit emotionally intelligent or maybe sometimes ever and that's a good thing too mm -hmm. um and that kind of sense of again all the interesting stuff in narrative happens in the gap the gap between poles right so so you, you're kind of balancing between that the whole time but i i guess that's what i think about when i'm writing things as well the the, the kind of curveball into that is which i think is really interesting I'm, I'm kind of particularly fascinated about it at the moment though i'm not really working on anything that really touches on this at the moment but is the interplay between that kind of play style, that emotional play style, and then the business of getting information out of the game. Because at any given point, a character might want to say, oh, you're so right, I really like you. Or they might want to say, I think you're an idiot. Or they might want to say, can you just tell me the way to the bank because I don't know which way to go. And like, that's not an emotional question and it's hard to make it one. And like, how do you balance those two things? So players can argue with the merchant in the shop, but also discover how much the waxwork candle costs. Um, and that's really interesting because those are two completely different axes of interaction. Mm. And I, I don't feel like I have a grand unified theory of that at all. Yet. <laughs> but it's kind of it's quite entertaining. Um, it's maybe subtext and context or something. Um, yeah. But those are the sort of things I'm thinking about. But mm. usually what I find is I write something which just feels like the script that I would have written if I was writing a linear script right. but without having to take too many decisions about what to say next because you can say either thing. And then I play it and then the, you look for holes, you look for what's the thing that a player would reasonably want to do here, but I haven't given them the option to do, mm. and how can I cover that space? And you never get everything, but you try to cover as much as you can. And that feels like a really healthy process. It feels like kind of, you really kind of broaden the space of what you're writing and then you get something and it's quite comfortable. I think it helps as well that even in Inkle, you know, we're very small, but like um, I tend to play in a, I tend to play games in a destructive, sarcastic fashion. <laughs> Joe, my co-founder, tends to play games in a low conflict, nice resolving kind of way. So between us just running through the game, we tend mm. to find, we tend to catch cracks quite quickly. Um, and then Tom, who's kind of been around with us for many years now, he's quite a strategic player. So he kind of looks for the, the ways to manipulate a scene. It's not quite the three play styles, but it gets some coverage. It's close enough, yeah. And how do you find that, um, so like, like you were saying, you know, if you've got, 
you, you want to give people those long, low complex options and you want to give them some high stakes options and you maybe want to give them a kind of chaotic, sarcastic option. Um, how do you find the actual writing of that when you do have a very distinct character like you're talking about in Heaven's Faults, where, um, you know, although you are playing through an avatar, the avatar themselves has a very distinct personality. Like how is that a difficult thing to manage, like um, putting a character that, that may not be low complex into low complex situations to kind of appease the player? Do you know what? I think it sounds like it should be, but in practice it isn't at all, because mm. like any actual human being is perfectly capable of being high conflict and low conflict at any given moment. And like, what does high conflict even mean? It doesn't necessarily mean aggressively shouting at someone. It can be snark or subtext mm. or passive aggressive. Like, Aaliyah is very bad at low conflict but she's certainly she's quite capable of being polite if she needs to and being she goes formal and she's not mm -hmm. very good at really being aggressive at people but she's extremely sarcastic which is a great way of doing it because it's high well i know it's high conflict and she knows it's high conflict but this guy might not realize that it's mm -hmm. high conflict and that kind of thing so i kind of feel like like i mean the character helps to limit how crazy you can get and that's good like you want to avoid the what was that game la noir the cole phelps thing where he just flips out and goes manic <laughs> and like that i think the writers on that once said that that was supposed to be part of his character his actual character was supposed to be a bit sort of manic or something like that but anyway it it comes out as very extreme and sudden and like i mm. definitely think there's there's art to writing it so that whatever they say next makes total mm -hmm. sense despite the fact the player might be veering all over the road mm. um but again, that boils down to not marking your choices up with some logo to tell you what kind of choice they are. Like, you know, the dialogue. Another thing, actually, I think, sorry, I'm, I'm flipping tracks, which is confusing. What I mean to say is another thing that's worth mentioning is in our games, we very rarely voice what the characters say, which gives us a really useful tool, which is the ambiguity of text. That if I mm. have a particular line in a particular place, you're going to read it differently depending on how you got there. So mm. one line from Aaliyah can sound very polite or extremely sarcastic, depending not on the line itself, but the line that came before it. And we lean on that a lot, I think, to make our text more branchy than it would otherwise yeah. be. Um, and that kind of thing. And that really helps as well. So, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this, though, is just about making sure that you don't you don't fall foul of the character. Like the character mm. has to be the character. Otherwise... You, you've kind of lost your you've lost your plot um, yeah 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 I don't know yeah it's hard but then writing is hard right like we all know that <laughs> so, yeah can be tough. <laughs> um and I think that must be an, a nice thing as well that being able to give the give the character the chance to act differently in different situations I imagine it's also a lot easier when you're either the only writer or you know one of few writers so you can kind of keep that continuation because I know um like I've written characters before where I've got them for you know this part of the game and I'll write them and then they go on to another part of the game and another writer and and that can be incredibly difficult then to kind of build on always like you know building on what the writers before you have done to to kind of keep them true um yeah I I, I really don't you. understand how game writers do that especially when they're not writing in a linear fashion like, mm. I guess in TV shows, they have, you know, rooms where they sit together yes. and make sure everyone is on the same page about who this person is, you know, and who they are by episode five and who they are by episode seven and all that kind of thing. I've mm. never done a writer's room, but like, I can really imagine how much work there is just in keeping everybody on the same caravan, where it's in a game context. Yeah, you have 25 people writing mm. the protagonist at different stages in their arc completely independently. And one person who's supposed to keep this smooth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, what? That's never going to work. Um, you know, and it's, as soon as it gets branchy and confusing, um, yeah, I can totally mm. see why RPGs have very blank slate protagonists yes. for exactly that kind of reason. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, again, it's, I think that, that there's so many problems which are like structural and production problems in games, which I just, glory in not having to solve and i know that's not very helpful in terms of advice but like it is it is really wonderful never having collaborated with more than one other writer on any of mm. our games ever at any point um because yeah and we i remember on 80 days and also on over the alps the the writing the writer's room that we had between both of those were, were two people two writers and they had this rule which was the right to delete which i love 
where both writers are considered to be senior enough that they are allowed to just go in and delete other people's work and rewrite it if they think it's wrong. And like, it turns out that if you're dealing with people who are professional and on a deadline, they mm-hmm. don't bicker too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of just evolves into place and you get this quite nicely coherent character despite everything emerging just from kind of the, the averaging process of mm. people reading through it going, what? That doesn't work. Um, and I really, I really enjoyed that, especially over the outs, which I wrote with Catherine Neal. We, we did it in about five weeks and the character is quite blank slatey, but like it evolved into place so quickly just because neither of us showed any particular mercy to the other person's work. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was really good but I can totally see that not working if you have even three writers let alone 25. It starts to get tough yeah but I, I do think that's um that is a really important thing for a writer is to is to have someone who will be that for you as well because I think it's the only way um that we can start to get better is by having that but yeah. you're right maybe not when there's 25 of you battling it out. <laughs> I mean the, the, I think the other problem is that we we we're all generating so much content because you have to you know you don't actually have to write three times as much stuff when you're writing interactive stuff but you more or less do and so no one has no one has the time to be brilliant all the time so you need to just get it down and then and get it better and yeah come out with the best you can come out with um which i quite like actually it's quite liberating because you know you, you never get it perfect so you can stop trying absolutely um i'm going to ask you one more of the questions that we that we have from um before the q and a's um which i really like because it's just something uh very different but you know it's not a question that i've seen asked before when it comes to narrative um, but the question is, what do graphics add or take away in terms of choice? Um, do you think that graphics um, and visuals can assist, enhance, or confuse choice? That is an interesting question. Um, what kind of graphics? I don't know. Like, are we talking about... Oh, I mean, are we comparing games which don't have any graphics, like an 80 Days game, with a game which has loads of them? or? I'm baffled. I'm baffled by that. <laughs> like, I think I remember when we transitioned from 80 days to Heaven's Vault. So 80 days is, it's not entirely ungraphical, but the, the prose is prose, right? Mm-hmm. And Heaven's Vault is in a 3D world. You're talking to characters. It's much more like a standard RPG in that respect. I remember struggling for a long time to try and work out what on earth I could actually have this player do because she could barely animate at all. She couldn't pick anything up. Mm-hmm. She certainly couldn't run anywhere. Um, and trying to trying to work out what the action was when I couldn't do action. So at that time, I was very cross about graphics because they were removing almost all of the things that I would do to punctuate conversations. Like, Plasma 2 is constantly climbing on hot air balloons and jumping out of windows. And, like, Aaliyah can't do any of those things. Right. (laughs) Um, But that was just something that forced me to learn about dialogue, I guess, and, and to put more emphasis on actual conversations and make them valuable. So... I can't conclude that graphics are bad and that text is good. They're just different, aren't they? So I guess what graphics do is they force you to focus on the specifics of a moment because you can see that moment. You have to be there in the instant. You have to be there in this particular second in which something is happening because someone can see it on screen. Whereas text lets you, I don't know, jump a thousand years in a single choice if you feel like it. You can talk generally. You can talk kind of widely. And that's a lot of fun, but it's also kind of gets you away from the character maybe or, or kind of into different spaces. So I, I just think they're completely different. But like, yeah. Yeah, but it's definitely fundamental. You, I, I can't imagine writing something and not knowing whether it was going to be graphical or how graphical it was going to be. That would seem like a waste of time, I think. Yeah. Um, that's great, thank you. Okay, so we've had quite a few um, questions from the audience come in. So um, I'm just having reading that some really interesting ones. Um, <laughs> I've had right, so I, I'm going to ask this one. You're probably going to hate this, John. This is another essay question, um, <laughs> but <laughs> someone is asking for the the answer to the direct question: How do you make choices matter? Oh, no, that's lovely, because I've been thinking about okay, that good. all day. Um, yeah, yeah. How do you make choices matter? Uh, so you don't, is the answer. An answer. That's the proper essay answer. You don't make choices matter, because choices aren't actually important. Choices are a tool for getting the player to do two things. Firstly, to buy into the game, 
and be hooked by it and secondly to take some responsibility for it so choices are intriguing and choices are also condemning and both of those are just ways to grab the player get your hooks in them say no you've got to pay attention to me you can't look away from this while you do whatever it is you wanted to do in the first place so I'm not really interested in making choices matter. I'm interested in making stories matter and making mm. characters matter. And then the choice is simply a way to, you know, when you go to a fairground and the fairground guy in like the Victorian fairground is shouting, come and look at my amazing freak show or look at this incredible bucket or win this octopus. And they're trying to draw you over to their stool or the guy who's trying to sell you that rug when you go to Morocco, he tries to draw you over and get you interested in this thing. Because once he's got you, then he's got you. Um, that's what choices are. Mm. And then all you have to do is not break that bubble. All you have to do is make sure that the choices are keeping people there and they're keeping them happy and they're keeping them fed and they're keeping them warm and loved and cherished and challenged while you do whatever it is that you actually wanted to do. Um, so I don't think choices matter. I think choices can be bad and choices can be the wrong choices. But like I saw another a question come and go on Twitter when the when you guys were asking for questions, and one of them was, uh, you know, is there an example of any good question, choices in games, particularly good choices? And I couldn't think of a single one. And I thought, oh, I must be a total <laughs> imposter who's never played any games. And I thought, no, it's because if a game is good, I don't remember the individual choices mm. because it's not about that. Like, there's that um, there's that old episode of Red Dwarf, right, where Rimmer is telling explaining a game of risk to Lister and Lister is like dying of boredom and Rim's like no I haven't got to the good bit yet and Lister goes oh go on fine and Rim says and then I rolled a five and a four and Lister goes no and it's a great joke because it exactly captures that the, the precise moment of what happened in a board game when you rolled a five and four is never interesting ever it mm. is never important but that doesn't mean the board games are bad or boring it's just that's the wrong component to be looking at and I feel like that about choices people get very excited about whether a game has proper choice or not mm -hmm. in it but I don't care. What I care about is how did it make me feel? Was yeah. did I care? Did I not care? If the choices helped with that, great. If the choices didn't help with that, take them out. Um, make them better, whatever. But yeah. like, uh, so the short answer to how do you make choices matter is do your job properly, um, which is quite hard. But uh, yeah, no, yeah. Girl. I think that's a great answer. Um, and it kind of comes back to what you were saying before about this this idea of getting kind of caught up on branching and the idea that to, to be branching you've got to have you've got to end up in different places and I think the reality is like you said it's the story that's important it's the characters that are important and the the choices themselves um are just kind of a space for you to play in right as a player it gives you yeah. it, it gives you a, a tool to explore the narrative space that you're in um, I think I think there's this this the problem basically arises I think from choices are still relatively new um, and mm. when people encounter new things, they assume that they're going to do new and interesting things. But actually, if you look at like all media and all technology, what we do is we take the new thing and then we do exactly what we were doing anyway, but using that thing to make it more effective. So we invent Twitter and it doesn't mean that everyone is suddenly nice to their celebrity heroes <laughs> um, or like gets to chat to President Obama. What it means is we do exactly the same bullying and harassment and kind of networking that we do anyway. We just do it super fast. And that's what Twitter is. It's just a machine for compressing all of human interaction into a shorter time frame. OK, mm -hmm. fine. We're still the same people that we were. We haven't done anything new. And I do think choices are really like that for the most part. And branching narrative is like that for the most part. Like we are just creating theatre, plays. We're framing an experience and making it as gripping and interactive as we can. And if a choice is a tool for doing that, then fine, use it. But mm -hmm. we're not going to, you know, people talk about kind of like making stories where you're fully in control or that simulate every action or you know let you really drive the whole experience and that just sounds like a computer science project that's never going to end like it doesn't sound like a story to me because mm. like there are twine authors out there who have made games in which every choice is one button and you can't choose anything else and they are way more compelling than any procedural story experiment i've ever seen where you get to decide what happens because I don't actually want to decide what happens because if I was doing that, I'd just write the story myself. <laughs> Maybe that's me. I don't know. But I think we get, yeah, we get hung up on the technology, but the technology is just a means for one human being to annoy and entertain another mm. human being. And we just, we shouldn't get away from that really because that's why we're here in the first place. That's really great. Thank you. Um, so another question we've had sent in is, um, 
going back to your uh, AdventureX talk that you mentioned um, earlier on. Um, so at AdventureX, John, you stated that three choices is best, um, but games like Disco yeah. Elysium have shown that more can be done. So the question is, do you still stand by three? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I didn't like Disco Elysium very much. I thought it had too many choices in it, amongst <laughs> others. <laughs> um, in all seriousness, I you do whatever is appropriate to the moment that you're trying to do so like mm -hmm. disco elysium is a game which is about being like all over the place right so if you have a moment where you have 19 choices i don't know if they do that or not but like and it communicates that idea of being all over the place then great fine brilliant what's the point like it's not dogmatic i think the thing that the, the point that i was trying to make is firstly that people often get hung up on binary choices and binary choices are super dangerous as a writer because you almost always write the right one and the one in which the player attempts to not do the right one at which point you kick them and then they do the right one like it's really hard even as a proper experienced professional writer not to just do that um i remember when i started in games and i was writing interactive scenes there was this recurring joke that every bit of dialogue i was asked to write had one choice in it and it was always okay no thanks and someone would say, do you want to come and do this thing? Okay, no thanks. And if you say no thanks, they would say, are you sure? And then you'd have a choice which is, okay, no thanks. And you'd say, okay, fine. And if you say no thanks, they'd say, maybe later. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. You know, that, that binary choices, they just do that. Um, so if you have three choices, you have to think outside of the box. Um, you know, obviously there are cases where there are more than three. As soon as you have more than three, you're in danger of some of them just being a bit rubbish or like having a choice overload, which isn't an entertaining or interesting choice overload. And that's quite significant actually, and quite serious. Um, and yeah, I saw that a lot in my opinion in Disco Elysium, though I know lots of people really adored that game. <laughs> um, I think the other thing is I quite like the, I quite like the formalism. The game, I'm, I'm doodling with something at the moment which is forcibly limiting all choices throughout the whole game to three. And I'm quite enjoying the formalism of that. And it's definitely not right for every project and I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to people, but it's quite an interesting thing. How do you get enough expressiveness into, okay, no thanks, and what about this? Um, and I'm quite enjoying that at the moment. So... Yeah, no, three choices is the right number. Yeah, there are other numbers, other numbers may exist, but three is right. <laughs> but we don't recommend. <laughs> um, <laughs> They're dangerous. <laughs> dangerous numbers. Um, brilliant. Uh, so um, another question we've had come through. Um, so this is an interesting one. Do you think ludonarrative dissonance can ever be used as a tool? That is an interesting one. Um, like, that's a bit like saying can... Because ludonarrative dissonance is really suspension of disbelief. It's a break in your suspension of disbelief, isn't it? Um, so it's a bit like breaking the fourth wall or something in a film. It's a bit like saying, can you ever use that as a narrative tool? Yeah, I think you probably can. It's always probably going to be a gimmick. So if mm. you do, like, it's, it's definitely possible to do a bad thing, do it knowingly and effectively and make it work in a clever setting, which I can't think of off the top of my head. Um, but it's the sort of thing that someone will do it and everyone will go, oh, that's really great. And then no one will ever do it again because <laughs> 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 it will have been done at that point. Because um, in general, it's, it's like it's like saying, you know, can awkward sentence structure ever be artistically effective in a novel? Well, there have definitely been novels that written with extremely mm. awkward sentence structures. But like, is that the mainstream way to tell a good story? Yeah, no, probably not. Yeah. There's a reason those things aren't the norm, you know, there's a reason yeah, they're the exactly. outliers. Yeah. 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 Friction is friction is friction. Yeah. Um, we've got about three minutes left, so uh, let's probably do one more question. Um, okay. So uh, the one I've got here is, uh, should choice based games have a true ending or does the idea of a true ending diminish the others? So I'm not very interested in multiple endings generally and not very many of my games have multiple endings mm. or they sort of sometimes do but it's I always feel like if people get hung up on the ending then it suggests that the journey wasn't necessarily very interesting that said endings I think are really hard to get right mm. interactively and I think there's still quite a lot to be discovered about them I'm not sure I've seen many games especially longer ones which really have an ending that 
that kind of balances the needs of the player's sense of their journey versus the needs of the narrative. So like what we tried to do with Heaven's Vault, which I thought was interesting, and I don't know whether it worked very well or not, was um, have a choice at the end in which a player could culminate the arc that they had been developing. So if they'd been developing an arc in which they turned Aaliyah into a very social creature, there was a social type choice mm. you could take. And if you did that, that would nail that your arc home and if you were developing your earlier into someone who really didn't care about anybody else there was a ditch everybody else option and, and that kind of thing so there was a right so if it had been a film there's this climactic choice where the character does that characterful thing and that wraps up the narrative and that choice was available to you if you wanted it mm. but if you were a player who did you know an entirely sociable run and then ditched everybody well you can press that button too but i'm not sure what i wanted that to do is i wanted it to feel like the end of a third act of a movie you know without too much action because she doesn't animate very much um i think in reality most people just approached that choice and then just took a decision based on how they felt at the time and then the game ended and they were like oh okay and it didn't have a sense of weight behind it which is i mm. think what, what it was going for and i'm not sure i know exactly how that could have been punched up because endings yeah endings are really difficult to get right so i suspect i suspect if I don't have a brilliant idea for any given narrative I'm always going to pull it down to a single ending pretty mm. much and just and just say look you had your adventure you had a nice time here's an ending which which sort of gently reflects things you've discovered or seen along the way and, and feels unique to you but um but yeah but but big branching endings don't make sense to me because you know like who cares ultimately who cares yeah um, like just just by that point i'm not really in the game anymore because it's ended so stop please and don't like I, I really hate that thing where you finish a game and you want to go oh i want to go back and look at the other endings because that just means i my ending i just threw in the bin straight away yeah uh that's brilliant thank you certainly that is um the end of our hour um so thank you very much for joining us john um that was really interesting it was really great to chat to you um Thanks, yeah thank you for sharing your insights it's just lovely to talk to someone as well. <laughs> really nice. Definitely. And thank you for everyone watching live as well. I hope you've enjoyed. Jolly good. Um, that was a wonderful session. I really, really appreciated that. Uh, I think that Andy might have a useful slide for us here. Um, oh, I could do that as well. Yes. Oh, yes. Te technical <laughs> stuff. Let me do the technical <laughs> stuff. Hey, um, uh, everyone. We, the we are... I Oh, sorry, the, the announcement, I, I don't know if the announcement was made at the beginning, but, but we are planning more events, so please watch on social media uh, channels, follow uh, the Writers Guild when somebody shares the screen, um, uh, and we'll be able to, you'll be able to get uh, the, uh, oh, no, that's done it again, you got a picture from one of my old plays, why is that happening? Um, we, um, but uh, we will be getting the, um, uh, the next set of events will be coming through um, and we are planning to do another mini festival similar to the ones that we did uh, last year uh, with a set of uh, uh, panels running at the end of April. So um, be looking at, uh, for, at the last week of April in your calendar for, for that. Sorry, Kate, I, I, I think I cut you off there and I'll try and get this. Up no, soon. not at all. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that you got that in. Um, yes, as Andy says, we've got all these new events to look forward to and more. So if you are a writer who writes in any other field, please uh, keep an eye open. You're now on our mailing list if you're not already a member. And the other last thing I'd like to say is, um, you know, it, we really look forward to hearing from any new writers. Please engage with us. Um, Andy is the chair of our games committee um, together with Samantha. And um, really, this is a very active committee of people. And if we are going to help people in your industry, a burgeoning industry, we need you. We need you as members, but we need to hear from you. We need to hear your problems and your dilemmas. So please, this is your union and make it your own. We'd love to hear from you. Um, thanks for attending. Bye bye. And, and uh, oh, if you want to follow any of us, John, do you want to put your Twitter address out or anything? If anybody wants to follow those, uh, I've put some things out on the chat. Apologies about the, the failure to share screen, uh, John. Uh, yeah, I can't put it in the chat because that's limited. But my Twitter is John Ingold and Inkle Studios is Inkle Studios. That's me. And you can follow me at, at English Scribe and you'll find the Writers Guild at, at the Writers Guild. Who would have thought? <laughs> Thank, Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, everyone. Have a, have a good look with uh, with all your projects. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yes, bye. Thanks, bye. Bye. Bye.